Uh, welcome everyone. This is the panel of Renewal of Faith, Renewal of Family and Nations. Uh, let me introduce the speakers. I am going to be chair and speaker. Uh, I'm going to start with Dr. Jeremy Jorgensen. Dr. Jeremy Jorgensen is from the School of Family Life at Birmingham John University. Then uh, I'm going to present Dr. Rick Scarborough of Vision America and Vivian Adams, also chair of Joseph F. Smith Family Association. And the title of the presentation is going to be The Intimate Circle Family Come TV. And uh, last, let me introduce myself. I am Rodrigo Ivan Cortez from Mexico. I am co-founder and vice chairman of the Political Network for Values. That it's a, a political network of members of Congress of 25 countries, uh, about 120 uh, members of Congress in favor of life, family, and fundamental freedoms. Well, uh, let's start with Vivian Adams, please. Thank you. I am so pleased to be here, and I thank you for your kind introduction. And I'll just go ahead. Um, it's a privilege to be with you today, and I really want to thank the Sutherland Institute and the ed dedicated efforts of everyone who has put this together and, and who has chaired and uh, prepared this session. Now, I'm here as a representative of the Joseph F. Smith Family Association, but, and um, I'm here to share you, with you some thoughts on his establishment of the Family Home Evening Program in, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which uh, came about in the year 1915. This program is now celebrating its 100th year anniversary and it is a program designed for you and your family, whoever you are, whatever your circumstances, or wherever you may be. To begin with, it might be helpful to explain to you something about who the Smiths are. When I was a child, my grandfather, Joseph Fielding Smith Jr., told us that in the beginning of the, of the world, everyone was a Smith. When they did something wrong, they had to change their name. <laughs> Obviously, this had a great impact on the whole of mankind. On my way into this meeting, a certified genealogist told me that the Smiths and virtually everyone in this room would be related. It was not a matter of DNA, it was a matter of statistics. What this means is that at one time, all of you must have been verifiable Smiths. <laughs> but that you and I are cousins, and that a lot of you are Smiths at heart. <clears throat> Smiths have mottos. In a recent family gathering, an uncle informed our branch of the family that we stood for God, family, country, and football. We all understood where this was coming from because it has a history with us. Grandfather Smith gave us a family standard which came from his father, Joseph F. Smith. The best is none too good for you. He counseled us this meaning that we would seek for the good that would bless our lives and would also bless the lives of others. Now in action, our family has long been involved with the fight for freedom of conscience. We are people who seem to dream the impossible dream and are somehow willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. And we are therefore jailbirds. <laughs> Grandfather John Loomis that burned at the stake in Canterbury in 1556. Grandfather John Lathrop sent to the Newgate Prison, commonly known as the Clink, in 1632. 
grandfather Hiram Smith martyred in Carthage, Illinois in 1844, and all for religious conviction. He seemed to have a heritage of this. Now this brings me to Joseph S. Smith, who implemented the family home evening program in the church, and whom our family does not generally call grandfather. His children called him Papa, and his grandchildren called him Grandpapa, which we do to this day because it is a tie to the past. Grandpapa wrote us that he was born on a cold and bleak day in November of 1838, while his father, Hiram Smith, was, ironically, on his way to Liberty Jail in Liberty, Missouri. He was incarcerated there, according to record, because he was a friend to his brother, Joseph Smith, who founded the Mormon Church. When Grandpa was five years old, his father was murdered in Carthage Jail, where he had been again illegally imprisoned with his brother for conscience sake. Grandpa wrote that as a child in Nauvoo, Illinois, he hid in the outsheds of their farm to keep from being taken by the mob. This was his perception of the threats around him. When he was nine, his widowed mother, Mary Fielding Smith, walked her household of 18 people into the wilderness. Most of them were persons whom they had taken into their family. They began their journey from Illinois to Salt Lake, the Salt Lake Valley with six wagons, which one of which my grandpapa drove. They arrived in the valley in the year 1848, September. At the age of 13, he lost his mother, whom he adored, and he found himself rudderless and out of control. As was the way in the Mormon pioneer community, others reached out to ground a hurt and grieving boy. Because of this early loss of both father and mother, he was an extraordinarily tender-hearted man. He became the father of a large family. He called his children his chicks. He continually brought them together and taught them and sang to them as he recalled his father singing to him. If he had been away from home, as he was often compelled to be, he got them up at night, put his arms around them, kissed them, talked to them, blessed them. When he lost his first child, who died at age three, it broke his heart and he never got over it. Grandpapa was a vigorous and innovative leader. I believe his own experiences caused him to institute the family home program at the church. He asked members to dedicate one night a week to drawing their families about them for counsel and a reinforcement as to who they were and where they were going. But well understood that families often functioned under great pressure, were strained for time, and faced conflict within their environment. He knew the greatest measure of security and stability was found only in the nurturing and intimate circle of the home. In 1915, he counseled the members of the church we advise and urge the inauguration of a home evening throughout the church at which time fathers and mothers may gather their boys and girls about them in the home and teach them. This home evening should be devoted to prayer, singing hymns, songs, instrumental music, scripture reading, family topics, and specific instructions on the principles of the gospel and on the ethical problems of life as well as the duties and obligations of children to parents, the home, the church, society, and the nation. We suggested that the following results would accrue. Greater love at home. Increased obedience to parents. Faith will be developed in the hearts of the youth. Power to combat evil influences and temptations. As I grew up, we had occasional family home evenings with grandparents and attempted to hold them weekly in our immediate family. It is nostalgic to recall the family gatherings of parents, aunts, and uncles, and cousins in my grandfather Smith's home. He told us the stories of his youth and upbringing, of the family in Missouri and Illinois days, as he recalled the fathers and mothers and others from whom we had come, 
It seemed as if they were with us in the circle, and those moments were sacred to us. He instructed us in scripture and history, and it came to life. On one occasion, he went about the room commenting on the gifts that he saw in each child. When he came to my cousin Jeannie, he told her that her greatest gift was that of a cheerful heart. She immediately burst into tears. <laughs> Cheer did not seem as impressive as other gifts. Yet, as she experienced the trials of life, this characteristic, she said, became the most treasured of any she had. My mother and father, Amelia Smith and Bruce R. McConkie, were darling people. What a joy to have even known them. Mother was a great cook, seamstress, counselor, and mentor. Father, a superlative teacher and scholar. What was there that these fun people could not share or did not know? Family home evening brought scriptural instruction from our father, and what we drew from him was sustaining, and as we became adults, even exhilarating. He was a man who could not carry a tune. But he loved Handel's Messiah and could sing the whole of it off key. <laughs> Our favorite rendition from him, however, was the Cowboy's Lament. There was blood on the saddle. There was blood on the ground. There was a great big puddle of blood all around. How enthralling this dreadful and out of tune song was. <laughs> he also was one to recite poetry. A favorite being The Man from Snowy River by Australian poet Banjo Patterson, which, by the way, is 104 lines long. <laughs> now, Family Home Evening is a simple concept. Plan to meet weekly at a consistent time and place. Sing and pray together. Hold family councils, calendar, and take care of family business. It was the rule in our family that this be constructive and loving and no rebukes allowed. Teach one another, mother and father and child, taking turns with this obligation. Share interests and talents, play games and serve others. And last of all, the best refreshments. Now I would like to invite you, 100 years after the fact, to glimpse family home evening in the homes of two Joseph F. Smith descendants today, those of my niece Marianna and Tyler Allen, and my daughter Julie and her husband Matt Maddox, and then to glance into successful family, family home evenings worldwide.
my favorite memory from home and being as a child growing up was that my father wanted us to sing hymns. <coughs> Three, four, five hymns to begin with, and just as many to end with. The thing was, he didn't know how to sing. He loved to sing, and he loved the hymns. So I remember my mother sitting at the piano and trying to help him find his note to begin with, because he always wanted to sing the bass part, not the melody. So she would find wherever he was and play the note, the scale, up or down, lead him to the correct note, and then start him off, and then we could sing. Until finally, when I was in high school, he was invited to be in the word choir because he had progressed to the point where he could actually carry a tune. The only stipulation was he had to sit next to me in the choir so I could keep him on tune if ever he got on. <laughs> he did really well, and it was because we practiced every week in family night. family. My name is David. This is my son Devin. This is my wife Bryn. This is my son Bryn. That's my daughter Ashlyn. Alright, so that's now called Step the Dry Ice. I got dry ice. We're going to make a really, really cold solution so that we can then dip things in it and get them to instantly freeze. This is something that we've, we've done before. As a family, we do it uh, just because it's, it's fun, it's cool, it's really fun to shatter and smash things. For science. <laughs> <laughs> what things will, like, how they will interact with each other when they get really, really cold? We have marshmallows that we stuck in there, and we'll just go around the house and find different things. Oh. Yeah, different objects that we can stick in there and just, and just see what happens. Oh, that was very satisfying. Solid. <laughs> the story we did in the play was about my great 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 grandma and the Indians that raided her house. She went in the cellar and the Indians didn't find her. Where the Indians the punishment? Where is the punishment? <laughs> <lacht> wir haben äh, jede Woche haben wir Familien, äh, Rat, also Rat, wo wir äh, uns beraten, wo wir die Woche planen und überlegen, wann haben wir Zeit für welche Aktivität. Muss man entscheiden, was denkt man, was ist gut für die Kinder, sie wachsen, die werden älter, man muss immer wieder neu entscheiden welche Aktivitäten am wichtigsten sind. Ein ganz kleines Kind, drei Jahre alt, hat andere Bedürfnisse wie ein Kind, das zehn oder 15 Jahre alt ist. Und man muss ständig überprüfen, welche Prioritäten man als Familie hat. sisters are close, my children are close, our grandchildren are the same. Our lives and mine assuredly have been enriched spiritually, intellectually, and with the joy of living. 
We yearly hold a family home evening to honor Grandpapa's life, where several hundred of his descendants come for, yes, a lesson and treats. Michael Lyon, born to our daughter, this year has brought us three new babies into our lives. Michael Lyon is born, was born to our daughter Mary Fielding and her husband Jim Summerhays. Ken Edmund was born to our grandson Matthew Maddox and his beautiful wife Edney. And Benjamin Ryan, our gift from God to our granddaughter Jeannie Marie, who waited eight years to get him, and her husband Ryan Withers, who was adopted this October. What prayers we have for them. It was William Wordsworth who, in his famous ode, in the intimations of immortality, penned the following lines. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, has elsewhere had its setting, and cometh from afar. Not entire, in entire forgetfulness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. For some of us, there still is a memory of that precious time. It is the time to begin laying the foundations of the future of the world. Is this an exaggeration? My father would say in jest, the future of the world depends on you and what you say here tonight. It is imperative that stable and healthy families reproduce themselves. Whoever you are, whatever your circumstances, wherever you may be, family home evening can be a substantial aid in your family, your greatest work. God bless you, my dear cousins, and all the Smiths at heart everywhere. <laughs> Well, they told me in seminary, if you want to be a popular preacher, always have a crowd out by 12 o'clock. So I give you my word, we'll be out here by 12 o'clock. <laughs> I tell you, the, um, what we just heard uh, is the solution to every problem we've got in this country. Thank you for that uh, that living testimony, because the family is the uh, is the essence of civilization, and uh, in far too many quarters we're now losing the family. I'm going to take a little bit different approach, and, and that's for all of our benefit. Uh, part of our assignment was the renewal of nations, and I want to talk to you about 
what I believe is required for us to renew our nation. <coughs> and I hope we understand that there's no presumption here. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, I will heal their land. We understand going into this that this is the, 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 the object of renewal, subject of renewal I should say, is always couched in the complete humble understanding that we have to meet certain requirements if my people, but only God can bring revival to our country. Uh, I am encouraged only in that we have been at the brink of collapse on several other dramatic occasions. Uh, this nation was founded in the throes of a white heart revival called the First Great Awakening that fanned the flames of, of freedom all up and down uh, the new colonies. Uh, the preaching of Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and a host of others uh, gave the courage that was required for the, for the colonists to throw off the yoke of slavery and the smoke of tyranny that was placed upon them uh, when no one thought they could took on the most powerful, tyrannical government in the history of the world to that point. And yet they had a firm reliance and confidence that their God was able. I, I'm going to quote you uh, from uh, Charles Finney in just a moment. Finney found himself as an attorney in an environment, uh, I find myself with my quote uh, hiding from you, so I can get it cranked back up here. But Charles Finney came uh, out of the practice of law. He was converted to Christ. He found himself in an environment uh, where, uh, if we can't make it work, I can live without it, but I, I'd like to have it, obviously. Is it not q and for some reason? Have you kicked the right front tire yet? <laughs> I thought I'd fill space we got that going. Maybe I'll be able to In the event this doesn't work, I'm going to go ahead and say that it was the greatest problem that you have ever seen. Now, if it works, I'm going to couch that a little bit. I saw it, it was good. <laughs> All right, we're ready now. Uh, it's just going to be a PowerPoint. <laughs> I'll do some prayer. Father, thank you for the incredible uh, testimony we heard and the, and the visual of a family living a life uh, that uh, demonstrates how good you are in orchestrating family. Now, Lord, as I speak, I pray you deliver me from presumption in any way. Uh, Lord, I, I thank you that you've called us to, to a, a high calling, to a very difficult but doable task. And I pray that we might infect these activists from across America and around the world to a new hope that you can regenerate, renew, if you choose to tarry. We pray that in Christ's name and for his sake. Charles Finney, I was about to say, found himself in a world of erupting in war. He found himself in a world where half of the continent believed you could buy and sell human beings as chattel, and where the preachers were accommodating such a belief in large measure. He said these words, and they are, they are timeless in their, in, in their impact. If there is a decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. We're going to play like I'm the choral director and you're the choir. Your part is the pulpit is responsible for it, so follow my lead. If there's a decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the public press lacks moral discernment, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the church is degenerate, worldly, the pulpit that is responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in Christianity, say it with me, the pulpit that is responsible for it. Now here's where it gets rich in our culture. If Satan rules in the halls of legislation, say it, the pulpit that is responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, say it, the pulpit that is responsible for it. The preaching of an attorney converted to be an evangelist flamed courage up and down on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line and gave us the, third, the second great awakening that I believe saved the republic. Uh, it resulted in a bloodbath in which 600,000 soldiers gave their life 
in which a generation walked halt and lame and maimed from the brutality of that war. A president was shot a hundred days into office and then took weeks and weeks and weeks to slowly die. These were the times which Charles Finney found himself. I believe that as the church in America goes, so goes America. Apply that to the country from which you come. It is the church that measures and is the thermostat for what the country becomes. But remember this, as the pastor goes, so goes the church. So if you understand that, what we have in this country and what we have in so much of the world is a preacher problem. Now, if you say that, I'm not going to fight you, fight you for it. I am a preacher, so I can say that. <laughs> but I acknowledge that it's true. How many lay people have I heard say, where are the preachers? Well, in the first place, don't, all, don't, don't make a blanket statement because there are thousands of preachers standing up and risking jail. When we ask preachers across America to stand up and pay for and sign their names to the dotted line, taking out full-page ads in the Washington Post and USA Today back on the brink of before the judges gave their ungodly ruling denying natural law and imposing same-sex marriage on this country. We had more pastors across this nation respond than we could include. We had to build a website that contained 60,000 plus names of people who literally said, I will go to jail before I obey this wicked command. And now some of those preachers are facing that kind of, of tyranny. Um, it says uh, that I can go to, to uh, iTunes, QuickTime, or something else. You can click out of that. I don't think that's what you meant. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I want to hear your iTunes. Two world views have collided. All right, here we are. I want you to think about what, what's happened in America. And I'm, I am watching my watch, and I'm going to be through here. I, I gave myself 18 minutes, so we can have plenty of time for questions. The reality is, we're living in what I like to refer to as a Dietrich Bonhoeffer moment. Now, if you're not familiar with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you need to, to get familiar with this man. He was one of the few preachers who stood up in the face of Adolf Hitler and said, Hitler, you're not my Fuhrer. God is my Fuhrer. And for that, he was martyred. He was hung by a piano wire in a concentration camp where he'd been housed for months, uh, withering away slowly. He, rather than then go along, he was executed just three weeks before Allied troops would have liberated him from that concentration camp. You heard the quote from Do uh, Dr. Pfeiffer just earlier. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. This is a Bonhoeffer moment in America. Not just for the preachers, but for every born again follower of Jesus Christ. We must stand against the tyranny. Now let me lay this foundation for all of us to consider. As I have read and studied my Bible, I've made a lifetime of that, there are three inevitable events that are going to happen in the world. First, the corruption of all humanity. In fact, we're going to see the collapse, of, secondly, the collapse of all human institutions, and finally, the withdrawal of God's presence from this earth. Now those are indisputable and inevitable facts that are going to come to anyone who embraces the Bible as the guidebook or the Word of God for their lives. Regarding that first point, the corruption of all humanity, the morals and ethics of mankind will degenerate into chaos and terror. The Bible says in Luke 17, 26-27, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, Married and given in marriage until the day in which Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and washed them all away. By the way, it's interesting to me that the, the radical homosexual movement embraces the rainbow as their symbol. <laughs> Professing themselves to be wise, they become as fools. Franklin Graham was right when he said to the national press just after the day, the, the, the Obama administration lit up the Capitol in rainbow colors, that the rainbow was to remind us of God's judgment against sin. Yes, the hope of redemption, but certainly judgment. Genesis 6, 11 tells us, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and it was full of violence. We are living in an increasingly violent world. The Bible also teaches the collapse of all human institutions. Don't think for a moment government's going to save us, or higher education, or the World Congress for the family. Now we all have a role to play. But no institution is going to save us. 
The governments and institutions of mankind will fall away. Hebrews 12, 27 says, the, the, the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that that, that which can, cannot be shaken may remain. And I want to remind you of this. Two things on earth were not created. Truth was not created. God, Jesus, is the essence of truth. Truth is revealed, and truth can never be displaced. It will always prevail. It was put there by the divine architect of all truth. And secondly, the bride of Christ, the church. She was instituted by God for his son. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, the two will be joined together forever. The reason that natural marriage is under an all-out attack is that natural marriage reveals much about the nature of God and his love for mankind. And that's why I believe Satan has leveled his sights on the destruction of marriage. Why we should defend it. Finally, the withdrawal of God's presence from the earth. Uh, the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, Paul writes, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so, so until he is taken out of the way. Some believe that the one is a reference to the church. I happen to be of those who believe it's a reference to the Holy Spirit. And while there will be a day when man will finally get exactly what he demanded, a world without God, the fact of the matter is, as the fear of God in society begins to wane, primarily due to the, to the failure of the church, the failure of people to present their faith in the public place, the increasing silence of the church, evil begins to rise and there's no checkmate to evil apart from the revealed truth spoken by those who represent that truth. We are living in a day when there is a massive pulling back of everything godly in this world. You ever ask yourself what a world would look like without God? It'll be a world without love. It'll be a world where there's no kindness, uh, where men chop other men's heads off, where brutality is the course and the normal uh, way of doing things. No mercy, uh, no compassion, no forgiveness, and no grace. Does anyone truly want to live in that world? Two choices for the pro-family movement as I see it. First, we can all pray and hope for the best. I prefer to be among those who pray and do something. You say, I don't know when all those inevitables come to pass. But it looked like the inevitable was coming to pass during Charles Finney's day. It looked like the inevitable was coming to pass during World War I, World War II. And there were enough preachers saying, this is it. The fact of the matter is, I believe every generation is given the right to push back. If the church, just a modicum, just enough to be salt and light, are willing to stand up and say, not on my watch. James 2, 14 through 17 says, faith without works is dead. There's a whole passage there, not time to read it. I want to share with you what we're doing. We're trying to find the remnant of pastors in this country who, like the men of Issachar, understand the times and know what it is that must be done. I'm not looking for the majority. There's no time in history when the majority got it right. The good news is God's never needed a majority. I'm here to tell you God, plus nothing, is a majority. But all when he gets a handful, what can he do? We're looking for those preachers. We're working with other organizations. The Bible says Jesus prayed that they would come when Christians would work together. Well, I'm here to report to you some of the greatest organizations in America are partnering full time now, <coughs> pulling our collective resources, and we're making a difference. You know, for years, we had no way of measuring what we were doing, and so we had events all over the country. We would brag about having thousands of pastors come, and we would entertain them and charge them, and they'd run out and boy, determined to change the world. <coughs> but we didn't have the, 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 the finances nor the resources to do what had to be done. We're now recognizing that this is just the entry level. Get as many pastors under the truth as we can. We'll spend 80% of our resources and time getting a small minority of pastors in a room. Uh, that's the event. We then began to find those who are willing to drop aside their denominational differences on Monday through Saturday, pray, preach, and partner together. If you believe that God is and that Jesus is the only way, I'll partner with you. We then begin training them in cultural impact training. Teach them how to change the culture. We are then engaging what we formerly knew as the Pew Initiative. We now call the Max 28 
20 pastor or 20 28 pastors that's the verse where God instructs the, the, the pastors become God's under shepherds and to know their flocks and what we do and what we have been doing successfully is we take the membership roles of the churches that will work with us we simply filter them through public record and give back a pie chart to a pastor of how many people in his church is registered how many of them voted in the last election how many voted the last two elections last four elections and here's what we've discovered we've discovered as we've worked in all these states in the last election cycle and we worked there successfully I might add without ever endorsing a candidate in every state we worked the what we prayed for in terms of outcome was the outcome and all we did was work with a modicum of pastors who mobilized their people uh, the actual results, I want to explain what this graph is, and this is just two of the states we worked in out of about 12. These are the folks that we had no relationship with, the general population, that in that election cycle that had never voted were registered to vote. These are the ones that, uh, that declared themselves to be pro-life, pro-family, but didn't go to church. There was a 76% uptick in the election. But in the churches, among those who had never voted, we increased voter registration by 84%. We're working on the other 16%. This state, I believe, was Florida. This state was North Carolina, 42, 59. But when we worked with pastors, we saw dramatic results. Remind you, elections are won in race within margins. You see, we quit because we think it just can't be done. But the fact of the matter is, it can't be done because it's not being done. If we would just do our part. I want to show you something. It's the last graph. In these, uh, in, in the states, elsewhere in the state where we didn't work, 16% voted. 16% uh, of those who were registered increased the vote. 23% in among the pro-life, pro-family that didn't go to church. But in the church, in this particular state, we saw a 48% increase. This state, 62%. This state, 70%. This state, 81%. This state, 95%. And all we did was give tools to pastors. I'll tell you something, folks. It's not the time to close up shop and just say, well, it can't be done. There's some percentages, the difference in the turnout. It's not time to quit. It's time to go to work. I don't know when Jesus is coming. Do you? If he comes before I get through, look up John 3.16 and read it carefully. I'll be out of here. But my calling was to work until Jesus comes and not to quit. This country is worth saving. She can be saved. If enough Christians, not the majority, but enough, will get back out in the field. God bless you all. Amen. Good work. Now, please, uh, let us hear Dr. Jeremy Jorgensen. Please. <coughs> How many here are grandparents? Okay. How do you communicate with your grandchildren? Do you Skype with them? How many of you Skype with your grandchildren? Okay. How about Facebook? Are you friends with your grandchildren on Facebook? How about texting? <laughs> texting? A few texters? Sounds like, it looks like Skype. What else? Is there something I'm missing? Oh, talking? <laughs> <laughs> Talking on the phone. Tickles. Coming over to the 
family for me. Make that right. <laughs> so I always ask my my students. Uh, I teach at the university, right? And I always ask them, how do you communicate with your grandparents? And I'm always just fascinated. Uh, if you text them, you'll get a hold of them. I'll tell you that. Can I just tell you, my 89-year-old mother-in-law, that's how she keeps track of her grandchildren. She's okay. texting with them. She thought, oh, we'll never want an iPhone. One of a kind. <laughs> <laughs> one of a kind, right? That's great. That's wonderful. Okay, if you're not a grandparent, how many of you have grandparents? That's a trick question, right? We all do, right? Okay, some of our grandparents are living, and we can do something to reach out to them. Uh, sometimes, even grandparents that have passed out on can have an influence in our life, like you were just talking about. Uh, I went to visit my grandma um, after my grandfather had passed away, and she asked me, is there anything of grandpa's that you would want to remember him by? And I said, well, could I have his hearing aids? And she said, well, nobody else will want that. Uh, so every semester, I show my grandpa's hearing aids to my classes. So they can see what a hearing aid looks like. It's, you know, these are college students. Most of them don't know what they look like. Um, and who knows? Grandparents may be around more than we know, helping us out. Uh, these are my grandparents here. My mother's grandparents right here, and my father's grandparents. And I lived with my grandpa. Uh, Yates here for about five months when I was in college and really got to know him in a special way and that's probably why I'm talking about grandparents here today. Um, I did a study a while back and at BYU and some people there made a little video. They, they interviewed students about advice they had received from their grandparents. So I'm going to show you this video. Now it's humorous. Um, you can see that uh, these students have a connection with their grandparents and that some of them have a little more personal involvement with their grandparents and others. Okay, so miracle number two of this, uh, if the internet will work. Oh, you have to say a technology prayer. <laughs> <laughs> so my granddaddy, he taught me that even if it's in the trash, it'll still make good spaghetti sauce. <laughs> a lot of practical advice, like uh, she always taught us to put the batteries in the fridge. Um, as, well, as well as camera film. Oh, and, you're not seeing uh, what I'm seeing. Let me uh, start over. Since you're seeing a PowerPoint presentation and I'm watching a video up here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we needed that technology. Okay, here we go. Let's try this one. Alright, so my granddaddy, he taught me that even if it's in the trash, it'll still make a spaghetti sauce. Uh, my grandma had a lot of... Let's see. I can do this. Uh, if you have grandkids, they can go. Uh, she always taught us to put the batteries in the fridge, uh, as, well, as well as camera film and um, silver dollars. My grandma used to say, if you know how to say garlic in any language, you can get a good meal anywhere. When I think of my grandma, I think of my hugs. My grandma had this song that she would always sing. If you're a liar, you better quit your lying. You better quit your lying. You better quit your lying. She's from Tennessee. So. <laughs> <laughs> versions. My grandma told me um, that if you try to dissect a person too much, uh, then you get a positive bad According to my grandma, vinegar is just, just good for the skin in general. She would caution you to frequently apply vinegar to your legs. <laughs> <laughs> my grandma once told me to kiss all the boys that I could because I would never know when the right one came around and I'd have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> my grandma looks at me and she's like, I'm not playing twice the price of half a shoe. My grandma just used to say, look with your eyes. Sometimes you're looking for something, so you should be open to find it anywhere. My grandpa always tells me to kind of keep things in perspective and to slow down, really. My grandpa told me to be the President of the United States. He could have sworn there was like a beater in there. If you're a beater, you better quit your beater. She always warned about promiscuous women. She would warn um, a pregnant woman to not look at a rat. Never to eat somebody else's canned fruit. Take it easy. Don't get too stressed. Things will work out in the end. Don't use rouge. Use lipstick. <laughs> Never get old. No matter what. All you can be is you. Don't say no to treats. Love donuts. Live your life. I don't know. My grandma, she's awesome. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> These grandchildren had a connection with their grandparents, and 
not all grandparent-grandchild relationships are positive, but many are. And we can try to encourage them. Because of increased longevity today, with men leaving, living up to seven, or around 76 years on average, women about 81 years, uh, we're seeing people in the grandparenting role for a longer period of time. Where grandparents knew their grandchildren as children in the past, they will know them as adults, sometimes now and into the future. Uh, so we'll have relationships in, in different ways with our grandparents, with our grandchildren. Now, grandparent interaction is largely dependent on that middle generation. If the middle generation gets along with the first generation, then there's more contact. Oftentimes, it, the literature suggests that it leans towards the mom's side. They call this a matrifocal tilt. There's a fancy word you can take home and share with other people. But, uh, but then we see a lot of families where they're closer to the dad's side, and sometimes that's because of proximity. Or, or other reasons, sometimes cultural. Uh, birth order of grandchild sometimes matters. Number of grandchildren matters. Uh, whether the middle generation is married or not can increase the amount of grandparent involvement. The grandparents' age, the grandparents' health. When the grandchildren have accomplishments, the grandparents tend to get involved a little bit more. And we know that divorce and remarriage influences the contact and assistance that grandparents give. Um, and grandparent rights, generally, just one legal point, uh, usually grandparents do not have visitation rights uh, in these cases in most states. There are some special situations where you can um, petition for that. Okay, we have varying grandparenting styles. We have the remote grandparent interaction, no contact, formal contact, the companionate, fun-seeking, nurturing, emotionally close. And then we have the more involved, in providing caregiving, sometimes even parenting types of roles. Um, we know that grandparents love grandchildren. They love interacting with their grandchildren. Uh, well, I, I say that as if there's all of it's good about it. Sometimes grandchildren are tiring to grandparents, uh, but they love their grandchildren. And grandparents oftentimes talk about how wonderful the grandchildren are. Less is known about how, what, how the grandchildren actually benefit from the grandparent interactions. Um, so let me show a little bit from the literature, and then I'll share a little bit from some studies that I've done. So grandparents often share resources with their grandchildren. Uh, adolescents in remarried families show fewer adjustment problems when closeness to grandparents was higher. Uh, greater cohesion with grandparents is linked to lower depression, depressing symptoms, especially when the parent-child relationship was strong. In a study of step families, better grandparent-grandchild relationships was linked with fewer behavior problems and higher self-esteem. This is especially for girls. And for boys, there were some significant associations, but at different times. This was a longitudinal study. Um, and then among youth from divorced families, relationship quality with the maternal grandmothers was linked to better psychological functioning. In other words, sometimes when hard things happen in families, when grandparents are there, that can make a difference for a grandchild in terms of psychologically how they're doing, socially how they're doing. A um, couple other outcomes, lower emotional difficulties, higher pro-social behavior, buffered reactivity to frustration. I see some of you taking pictures. If you want to copy these slides, let me know. I'd be happy to share them with you. Um, grandparent involvement may buffer negative decision making in teenagers. It may be positively associated with trust development, may improve cognitive, prosocial, and emotional development of children, and um, may be linked with less harsh parenting and lower depression among youth during times of economic strain. Sound familiar? Um, may provide important advice and wisdom for grandchildren. So there's, there's, really there's a growing literature showing that grandparents, not only do grandparents benefit from their involvement with their grandchildren, uh, but they, they help their grandchildren in, in many ways, important ways as they're developing. Um, let me show a couple of studies that I've done. Uh, in 2011, we published this study, some colleagues and I, on grandparents' emotional and financial involvement in relation to early adolescent child outcomes. And we specifically looked at pro-social behavior and at school engagement. And I'll define those in just a minute. Study number two was looking at uh, when there are disrupted family processes in 
families where kids are living with their grandparents, is that related to the kids' mental health? We kind of already know the answer to that one, right? Uh, these children, these uh, kids are in, uh, they're court involved. So these are in the juvenile justice system uh, in that study. And I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. Okay, so study number one. We had 478 adolescents. These are 11 year olds from a project called the Flourishing Families Project. Uh, this is longitudinal and ongoing, started in 2007, and we use data from 2007 and 2008. And um, looking at emotional closeness to a grandparent. So we asked the child, the children, uh, how, choose a grandparent, how emotionally close do you feel to them? How much do you like them? How much do you communicate with them? Have they talked with you about a problem? Have they given you advice? Have they talked with you about an important decision or choice? Okay, and depending on how they answered that, we related that to pro-social behavior and school engagement. We also asked the parents, have the grandparents given money in the last year to help you out? Okay. And again, our outcomes here are pro-social behavior with strangers. Now, this is kind of interesting. There's, there's pro-social behavior with family, with friends, and then with strangers, people that you don't know. And for some reason, this one stood out as being important in relation to grandparents. Helping others, even if it's not easy for you, helping other kids at school, volunteering, doing things for others, helping neighbors, listening to others' problems, those kinds of things. And here's our findings. Um, so emotional closeness, I don't think this pointer is working on the TV screen. So here's emotional closeness to a grandparent made up of these things. And it's significantly related. The first number here is for parent or grandkids in two parent family homes. Okay? And the second number is in single parent family homes. So we see a positive association with pro-social behavior a year later if the kids say they're close to a grandparent. Okay? Um, and then we also, and these are, these are not huge effects, but they're significant. They're statistically significant. We also see a larger effect for kids in single parent homes where the grandparents provided some financial support for the kids' school engagement. We don't know why, but for some reason, when the grandparents are helping out single parent homes, the kids are doing better in school. So we need to do a follow-up study to try and understand that a little bit better. Okay, study number two relates to custodial grandparenting. So sometimes grandparents come in and they become the parents. They take care of the grandkids, and the kids, grandkids live with their grandparents. Um, we see this about 6% of the time in the United States. Okay, uh, this uh, number here is from the U.S. Census. That it's not exactly grandparents raising grandchildren, but it's grandparents co-residing with grandchildren, 2.7 million uh, in 2012, under the age of 18, living with their grandparents. So why do grandparents step in and parent their grandchildren? One of the re well, part of the reasons is because what's happening in the lives of the grandchildren. The parents are in jail, they're using drugs, they're being abusive, or, or they got a divorce, or they have health problems, or they passed away, or something like that. So the kids need somebody to take care of them. And the grandparents say, I love my grandkids, and I want them to have the same values that I have. I, I want to take care of them. And so they end up taking care of them. Um, and most grandparents who raise their grandchildren say, I would do it again. What costs and benefits are involved? Well, it does take a toll on the grandparents' physical and emotional health. It's hard. It's hard work. And, uh, but there are social and emotional benefits to the grandchildren, and that's supported in the literature. They do much better than kids who go to foster care or to a home where they don't know uh, the people that are raising them. Okay, so study number two included 166 youth from a Midwestern county uh, I, I, it feels eastern to me, but I guess it's in the Midwest. 30% um, African American. And we looked at these disrupted family processes. And so these kids were asked, uh, do these things happen in your home? Fighting, the parents not knowing where you're at. Those are the two example items that I have. Those kinds of things. And then those were related to mental health distress. And... Um, that included internalizing, like depression, anxiety, and externalizing behavior problems types of things. It's interesting that the average disrupted family processes was seven in these homes. Probably in 
homes where the kids aren't involved in the court is probably around three or two. Uh, and then internalizing external systems average was 13. Um, I don't know what the average would, or what the normal would be for teenagers, probably half that. Uh, and our findings here, disruptive family processes were consistently positively related to adolescent mental distress. Um, it's also interesting to note that the African American males had the lowest disrupted family processes reports in the whole sample. And so I wonder if there's something culturally about them living with their grandparents that may, be, that may feel more normative to them. Um, okay, so the disrupted family processes is something that I want to come to. One of the leaders in research on grandparents raising grandchildren says that there's two main problems that grandparents face when they're raising their grandchildren. One of them is having parenting problems, and the other one is when the grandchildren have developmental, emotional, or behavioral difficulties. Okay, And um, I think when grandparents confront these and they don't know what to do, it looks like disrupted family processes. So I think if we do something about these, it may actually help to the, the youth to feel like they're in an organized <laughs> setting, a little more organized. So. Uh, most grandparents raising grandchildren already know how to parent because they've already raised their kids and they don't want to be told how to parent. Uh, but if we say, well, we have a new generation here. These kids are different. And so you could go to this training and learn how to take care of or how to parent kids in the new generation. And they could learn things such as these listed here. Support groups are also helpful. A lot of times grandparents raising grandchildren become isolated from their friends because their friends are going to the empty nesters and kids aren't allowed, or their friends are going to this and that, and they don't, they're not in the same situation. A lot of times they become isolated. And this helps them to, to be able to interact with other people. In Utah County, in most counties, there, there is a place where grandparents can go for a support group like this. They're, they're really spreading. They're all over. Okay, in conclusion, uh, grandparents oftentimes are the National Guard for families. When there's a crisis, they show up and they help. Uh, there's a lot of different styles of grandparenting. There's not a right way to do it. Um, and grandparents interact with each of their grandchildren differently. The important thing is to connect with your grandchildren as much as you can. As much, uh, I guess there's balance there. Maybe not as much as you can, as much as would be good. Um, so grandparent involvement can be helpful to them. And um, with custodial care, get some help. If you're a grandchild, reach out to your grandparents. Get to know them. Chances are they want to get to know you better. And uh, so, I don't know. My, my parents showed up one day at my house and they said, Grandma's in a nursing home. We think Grandpa's depressed. Would you consider living with him? And I said, Psh, I would think about that, right? So then I went and visited my grandpa. And he says, I hear you moving in with me. <laughs> How do you turn that down? You know? And I thought, you know, this is a great opportunity for me to spend some quality time with my grandpa and get to know him better, and it was wonderful. So I encourage this kind of thing, a little more micro than what you were talking about in terms of renewing and strengthening families. Similar here, I think if we strengthen families uh, intergenerationally, it can have an impact in our society. Thank you very much. Very glad to be here. I consider that the key uh, to the renewal of faith and nation is the family factor. The future of humanity is at stake. Therefore, we need to generate awareness regarding the importance of human life, dignity, marriage, and the family, since the future of humanity relies on family. 
This is where new members of society are born into and where basic social virtues are acquired. And we must remember that faith is transmitted first and foremost in the family. If we want to understand why family and life reach the present situation, we need to go to the roots, to the causes of the present situation, to get to the bottom of the problem and not just stay on the surface. The main struggle is between what we will refer as the culture of life and culture of death. That have their hinge and breaking point on life and family. It is obvious that human beings are fundamental to existence, but when our arrogance becomes such as to make us think we are the owners of life itself, this can lead to an anti-life culture where we feel we have the right to manipulate everything. Hence, we end up with an absolutely and exaggeratedly anthropocentric culture that cannot only be characterized as of an imminent disruption. In other words, the denial of all transcendence, faith, religion, and the positioning of the human being as the sole owner of the world and therefore of life. In light of man's anthropological need for the existence of God, God has been replaced by usury, power, pleasure, science, all of which end up turning men into a superstar incapable of loving and shut away in a profound selfishness. This perspective leads to the disintegration of the factors of human existence, to a human being who is split, broken, and incapable of achieving fulfillment inasmuch as he finds himself segmented into partial and contradictory aims. It is disintegrity, imminent, and socially irresponsible. Ever since men begin gathering in groups, the basic cell of their society has been family, and it has been, so far, 5,000 years of civilization. In the 21st century, however, materialism, consumerism, economic and political interest, as well the manner in which man has acquired the control to manipulate life have caused the family, society, and life to go into crisis. Each cell of the human organism is vital to existence. If the cells fail, the body dies. If the family breaks down, the cancer will end up invading the social fabric. We, since values today are apparently a matter of opinion, the changes in the family, the basic cell, generate radical transformation within society. Today, everything is relative. Opinions are democratic. Values and principles are those of the majority and the most convenient. Young people born into this world are like ships that are adrift, with no rigor to steer them and needless to say, with no part of destination where they can unfold. Even worse, there are increasing numbers of families that simply don't fulfill their functions. Families whose members don't speak to each other, who live together in front of the television set, but never face each other, who give their children freedom without explaining how it works, who purchase in cash the lack of quality time, in light of the absence of a solid family and the cultural invasion by media that presents hedonism, materialism, permissiveness, all of them anti-values that represent the new generation's view as increasingly normal to see the manipulation of embryos 
abortion, plumbing, organ trafficking, euthanasia, drugs, homosexuality, same-sex marriage, and transsexuality. Generally speaking, they are becoming, uh, becoming increasingly accustomed to culture where everything is possible, where nothing is good or bad, and where absolutely nothing has consequence. This is a culture of death. Family is not important as much could think only because of tradition. It is important because the well-being of society relies on it, at least as far as we know with fact and data. It is not a surprise to find out that countries, cities, or neighborhoods with a higher rate of family disintegration are also the ones that have more criminality, drug abuse, violence. Family is the first place we will socialize, spend time together, and where we learn the basic concepts of good and evil, as well as issues we have to do with social behavior. In this cell is where we are born, grow, develop, and open to others. It is where we establish our values. A personal formation depends to a great degree on the family. A functional family can create human beings with the ability to generate a positive transformation of society. A dysfunctional one can lead to societies. Family is the source of life, the one that drives the children, the basic self society. Anything that affects the, fa the family has a direct impact on the social well being as well as the economic prosperity of the nation. Humanity. Humanity's faith relies on family. It is where new members of society grow in social virtues. This is the relevance of the family. It is crucial even for the well-being of a nation, but it is not easy to general, functional, harmonious families with values and who are builders of society, strength and willpower, which are basic elements to maintain this institution. The present world places values and therefore families at risk. We have generated a society where main values are production and consumption, where everything is currency of exchange, and where ethics are another item on sale that can be selected or thrown away. Family disintegration destroys society. Respect for family, the most important value to everyone, is also lost when the family breaks up, and the same luck runs for faith, as it is transmitted primarily in family. It will seem evident that life is basic for human beings, <coughs> and according to that premise, it should be respected and considered sacred. Nevertheless, the scientific and technological advances the modern world has and the power we obtain over science, such as genetics, have made us see life as something controllable by humans, and therefore it loses its sacred nature. Life, culture, stresses the sacred nature of life, places it above human beings. It is a more humble view, where one accepts human being as a limited being. And of course, the life of others, the life of oneself, is it not in our hands? To accept that life and existence are above our powers bring us to the unviable conclusion of not being the best or the top of the world or the universe. That means that we have to accept the existence of, of a supreme being. This outlook is represented by its transcendental appearance of opening an encounter. Individuals open themselves to encounter to other, to others, and the other. The encounter with others open up a healthy social relationship, finding out that others share the same dignity and equality as limit as not superior human beings. This is the perspective of a humanism, transcendental and with solidarity, 
that its founding develops and becomes whole in love toward others. It is precisely here where culture of life steams. This is when race takes care and brings human life with all its phases in the vital human cycle with a special attention on the family since inside it family performance and functionally are fostered. A large communities rely on the family and this is why they are urged to support the rights and dignity of every family. This life culture must be observed in individuals, couples, families, society, and intermediate agencies, as well both state and international agencies. Culture of life in individuals plays a very important role since human life is planned, considered sacred and inviolable, conceiving and respecting the fact that human nature is free, rational, has affectivity, is sexy, relational and complementary, with inalienable rights that stem from the fact of being an individual, from conceptual to natural death. According to this concept, the embryo is a human being from conception and its integrity must be protected, taking care of a medical care for as any other being. Cultural life is plan of marriage and family. As a being of encounter, marriage and family are considered to be the natural environment of the union between men and women, generation about generation. This, is, this union takes us to the communion and fertility which, with love, births children to continue to have a society consolidated upon human values, the right to life, the first and basic of all human rights, takes place first in family. All individuals have the right to, to be conceived with dignity, love, and with responsibility from their natural parents who should take care of their natural physical and spiritual well-being, as well as to provide education within the family. Any violation or replacement of human way to father children is against human dignity. Marriage and the family is the right environment for human reproduction. The culture of life should stem from the fact that the family is the authentic school for humanity and the positive and proactive generator of society. The family is not only a generator of individuals, it is a builder of society. Society and the state mirror the families that form them. It values such as solidarity, justice, participation, collaboration, the use of authority as service, dialogue, respect for others, among other values, do not develop within the family. It will be unrealistic to expect these values to be an active element of society. From the perspective of culture of life, men and women share the same human nature and dignity. They share the whole world, the family and society. They have to live collaborating, complementing themselves with the respect for all differences that are results of nature and which enrich them mutually. The culture of life is one fostering family functionality which leads to the socialization of its members with harmony, collaboration and solidarity between women and men as well as among generations of parents and children, providing the transfer of cultural and social values in the state as well as international agencies, a culture of life creates common well-being, designs and promotes public policies and social initiatives regarding the family, with methodology and strategy to warranty responsibilities and rights of the spouses of and the family, placing the family as the main recipient of social policies and supporting it constantly. Society and government institutions are called upon to warranty and to favor 
the true identity of family life and to avoid and fight against anything that harms or affects it. Therefore, neither society nor the state can absorb, replace, or reduce the social dimension of the family. On the contrary, it must be honored, acknowledged, respected, and fostered according to principles of subsidiarity. The lack of enough well-paid jobs, poverty, lack of faith, and fair wealth distribution, as well as lack of opportunities to improve, undermine the strengthened family union. The primary victims of this situation are women and children who are left unprotected and exposed to multiple dangers and abuses, as well as youths who are pushed to criminality and evasion. It is for adequate development Families need a peaceful, quiet, and safe atmosphere with dignity and respect. A high level of public morality, clear examples of civic values, as well as citizen virtues of honor and republican sovereignty. There is a struggle to recognize, defend and promote the true dimensions and dignity of human life and the family within the framework of both national and international law through conventions and treaties in national congress as well as conferences and action plans of international organizations. So we have a lot of work to do. Thank you.